Mark 7 Auto Drive. Cool stuff. John here is going to show us how to keep this running perfectly. Gavin Gu here from UltimateReloader.com. I am joined by John Vlieger from Mark 7. This guy helps people get their machines running and help them stay running at Mark 7. He flew all the way out here to Ultimate Reloader having a bunch of fun talking about the Apex 10 system and all of the different peripherals and add-ons. This time we're gonna focus on the auto drive. Now I've already done a video where I got this thing out of the box. Hmm. I got the press hooked up to it. We got it up and running. In fact, that was also covering 45 ACP. Why don't we now give a quick overview of the system itself, but talk about all the things that you've seen yeah. that and all the things that someone wants to consider. I mean, when I think of an auto drive, I think of riding a motorcycle at like 180 miles per hour. Everything is going by a lot faster, right? Yeah. So it makes you think about your game a little bit better. <laughs> the way I like to think of an auto drive is a lot of people have background and experience hand operating a press and they may mm -hmm. be really good at it. But the second you use an auto drive, you're going to be able to go faster. Mm -hmm. but you also don't need to keep in mind that you've just lost that haptic feedback. Yes. You just lost the ability to feel what is going on on the press at any given time. Mm -hmm. you know, how many times you've been hand jamming and, oh, that didn't, that didn't feel right. Did that decap or did right. that seat a primer? Yep. So you kind of lose that. But what you gain is the on-the-fly sensors, the on-the-fly adjustments you can make uh, that'll help you keep running. That'll help mm -hmm. you catch problems as they, as they occur, not after, uh, and keep you operating, keep, keeping you making great quality ammo at a fast pace. Which means making money if you're a commercial ammunition or a boutique ammunition mm -hmm. manufacturer. Let's step back for a second. Auto drives from Mark 7. You've got your Dillon category yep. and you've got your Mark 7 category. And there is some crossover between the two. Okay. So this Apex 10 auto drive, we can just conversion kit this for uh, Dillon compatibility mm -hmm. or vice versa. So if you're using a Dillon and you have one of our auto drives and down the road you want an Apex 10, it's mm -hmm. only a few hundred dollars for the conversion kit. You don't have to buy a whole new auto mm -hmm. drive. So this auto drive though is a bit different than your typical auto drive. Let's talk about that for a second. Sure. So one of the ways that we kind of hit the scene running uh, <laughs> in back in 15, 16 was our first built-in sensor, digital clutch. Mm -hmm. Digital clutch is just a trip wire to keep you from breaking something. So mm -hmm. on the downstroke, once, like I mentioned, the haptic feedback, the handle, mm -hmm. as you come down on the downstroke and you crush a case or a case didn't feed in the shell plate, what have you, you're going to feel that. Yep. Well, the digital clutch replaces that. It is a on-the-fly adjustable number from zero all the way up to 20, depending mm. on how much friction, how much force you need to overcome to get the job done. And that's where this auto drive system is a little different, right? Yeah. This system knows how much torque it's applying at any given mm -hmm. point in time. It also knows where it's at in the stroke at any given time. Correct. And so that means that instead of you having that different rhythm. You know how some presses, they just want a certain rhythm? Yep. And, and you give it that rhythm that it wants. This, this press has a dwell on the bottom that you can set and a dwell on the top. It works with the electronic powder measure, right? Like mm -hmm. there's quite a bit more capability yeah. and fluidity here. I think of it as efficiency and optimization, right? If you're trimming those cases and you want a little bit slower time while it's trimming the brass mm -hmm. down. We have a feature or a setting for that. Yeah. So, it is a modular system. We're yep. going to be adding sensors to this. We can do things like know if we're decapped. Yep. Primer orientation sensor. The bullet sensor, which is pretty cool. It projects that laser. Mm -hmm. You know, There's quite a bit of capability here. And when you're going 180 miles per hour, it's good to know that everything is counted for, right? Yeah. <laughs> ABS uh, and all the rest on your motorcycle. A big part of my job is instructing people on how to get the most out of their machine mm -hmm. and how to set it up, how to keep those settings, how to check that your sensors are doing what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So we'll get in that into a separate video. Sure. But uh, kind of the goal here with this one is to kind of give the user a do's and don'ts or a general overview yeah. to show them, regardless if you have an Apex 10, Revolution, uh, or one of our Dillon Auto Drives, mm -hmm. this is going to be apples to apples for you. So our tablet uh, user interface here is going to be the same. This tablet's universal. This tablet, can, I can slap this on any of our other auto drives with no, I mean, it's plug and play. Gotcha. Uh, much like our machines are plug and play with our automation and Dillon machines are to an extent, you know, uh, mm -hmm. well, actually, no, they, they straight up are plug and play. Uh, even though our machines were developed to be automated, you know, we set out from day one, if we're going to make a machine, mm -hmm. we know we want to automate it as opposed to trying to make a product that automates somebody else's product. So if you need 
if you need uh, a physical space for a sensor, you can design that right into the machine. Correct. Right? And that's what and we did with our primer orientation sensor. We actually had the cutout here before we had finalized the design, uh, and that allowed us to be uh, backwards compatible before we even yeah. had anything out yet. Yeah. A good uh, incremental innovation, right? Exactly. And we yeah. haven't stopped yet. Uh, we have some plans in the works. I think it's going to surprise some people. Can't talk about it here. Okay. But uh, just keep your eyes open. All right. So, yeah, just keep your eyes open for that. <laughs> Why don't we start with the general do's and don'ts then? Sounds good. So, uh, general considerations, like I mentioned, you are removing that handle, mm -hmm. the, the haptic feedback. So, calibration is very important. When I say calibration, the machine needs to find its bottom of the stroke, find its top of the stroke, and then it's going to operate within those limits. Mm -hmm. So, the machine is going to find the resistance at the bottom of the stroke, set that as zero, count the steps till it reaches the top of the stroke, set that as 2,000, what have you. And then it's going to operate about five thousandths of an inch off those uh, limits to make sure you're not making metal on metal contact unnecessarily. Gotcha. What that means for the operator is you need to make sure you don't have a die touching the shell plate that's going to give it a false bottom. Yeah. Uh, if you run with your tool head bolt extremely loose, you know that could affect your, your calibration. Mm -hmm. It could affect uh, the, the operation of the machine. So when the machine is calibrating itself, it can't have anything interfering with the sensing of those two hard stops, right? Because it's going to be like cases on the shell plate. Yeah, and sometimes you do want to die maybe touching, and maybe you back that out a little bit so that it can calibrate freely, and then you give it just what you want for mm -hmm. for your own particular die setup. Yeah, with that, and with the consideration that if you do have that die set too low with mm -hmm. a previous calibration, you can damage your shell plate. Right. So uh, unlike with like single stage presses that have a real sturdy single cast uh, shell holder, you're, de you're dealing with a detailed machined shell plate. We don't want to roll any edges or cause any damage. So what's a good guideline for when you need to calibrate? Uh, when you, uh, calibration uh, recommendation is anytime you lose communication. So if the power goes out or you unplug your USB, the machine's going to force you to recalibrate because it's not confident that nothing, nothing's changed. Mm -hmm. When it has communication, it knows if the drive shaft turns gotcha. or if the, uh, the motor turns or what have you. So it keeps track of that even when it's in neutral. Right. Uh, if you lose communication, lose power, uh, then it's lost that on purpose. It's going to force you to recalibrate. Mm -hmm. You do not have to recalibrate just because you had a stoppage or just because you, uh, you know, ran it dry a little bit or for any variety of reasons. It's gotcha. really only if you lose communication or you've made a change internal to the machine. Gotcha. Makes sense. So if you just did detailed teardown and you took it apart for whatever reason, you put it back together, yeah, you should probably recalibrate. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a good... Uh, the analogy I like to give is you wake up in a dark hallway. Mm -hmm. The machine's reaching out for those walls to find mm -hmm. where its operational space is. Mm -hmm. You don't want to have something blocking it from getting a solid read of where those walls are. When in doubt, calibrate then, huh? Correct. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, next up is cable management. So cable management on this machine is really non-critical, meaning you can do whatever you want to it. You can zip tie uh, your cables with the exception of your USBs. The USB cables, uh, we don't want any extra EMI, electromagnetic mm -hmm. interference. So we do have filters built into our USB cables to help minimize that. But when we start zip tying USB cables to you know, high voltage power cables, you run the risk of having EMI. Uh, interfere with the communication of the machine. Mm -hmm. So in the case of cable management, we have some uh, zip ties here and I'll be doing some more cleanup down the road. Yep. But we're going to leave these USBs freestanding. Okay. So they're not attached to anything. You know, people like to zip tie them to their case feed. Mm -hmm. You just zip tied it to an antenna. So right. it's not really going to give you the best <laughs> results, uh, at least uh, repeatable results. Yep. Uh, next up is talking about basically lock it down. So especially if you've been loading, uh, you know, the last week or you went on vacation, what have you, you know, especially if your press is accessible to somebody else, mm -hmm. make sure no uh, dies have been fiddled with. Just do a quick tie down check. You can use markers or Sharpies mm -hmm. to give yourself some index marks on your dies. So mm -hmm. a quick glance gives you the confidence mm -hmm. that nothing's moved or shifted. It's still tight. Mm -hmm. uh, shell plate being tight, both for uh, Dell machines and our machines, uh, is critical to, to indexing. Doing your mechanical checks. Do your due diligence that things are uh, secure before you start running the machine. Yeah, what I found is once you get more than one person using a particular set of reloading equipment, those procedures, and maybe the procedure is to make your witness mark after you've locked down the, the lock nut, right? Mm -hmm. You gotta have a little bit more consistent regime to know exactly, exactly where things are left off and what's mm -hmm. been changed, if anything. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, 
the fourth, when it comes to just general considerations, as you talked about, about when you have to calibrate, mm -hmm. uh, some people uh, get misconstrued that if they have a stoppage, you know, they have a, a split case, we'll say. Sure. Or they have a case not, uh, not get primed. Small it, primer pocket 45 ACP, the bingo. devil itself. <laughs> uh, you have a stoppage like that. Yeah. So the process is to clear the stoppage. So mm -hmm. actually, first off, it's to get to a point that you can work with the machine. So if we have a stoppage at the, the bottom of the stroke, mm -hmm. I can do is something as simple as jog uh, down or up to clear the tool head from the stoppage. Mm -hmm. And I can remove that stuck case. So let's say it was at this station. Oh, that one's tight. Okay, I'm going to remove that case. Yeah, it's a, it didn't get primed or upside mm -hmm. down primer, what have you. I can then take a fresh prime case that I have ready, throw it in that station, and hit run. Mm -hmm. Now the caveat to that is the number one source of, we're gonna say boo-boos, okay. you know, <laughs> bad boo-boos with the machine is a user, uh, user error. Mm -hmm. So you just had the machine stop. The machine can only do what, it's, what it can do. You just interjected something, you just changed something. So anytime I have a stoppage, I give myself a timeout mm -hmm. because I may be distracted. You know, the machine's mm -hmm. doing the work for me. So I need to put, do my due diligence to make sure the machine is in a condition that I can run it. Yeah. So I just changed something. Before I hit run, I'm gonna check to make sure I have powder where I'm supposed to have powder. I have bullets where I'm supposed to have bullets. Yep. And I can do my quick visual check. I have, still have powder, I have projectiles, so on, mm -hmm. before I hit run. That's your opportunity to give yourself a timeout and make sure before you hit that big green button, it's where it's supposed to be. Yeah, never, never be in a hurry with a stoppage, right? Exactly. That's how people get double charges or squib loads mm -hmm. or and it's user, other problems. It's, majority of it is user yes. induced. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's what it comes down to. You have a stoppage, you're not in a rush on, anymore. Mm -hmm. The machine's not running. Okay, mm -hmm. waiting five, 10 seconds to make sure it's good to go before you hit run is gonna pay you dividends. Sounds good. So moving on to the user interface, and this is uh, once again applicable across our family. But I just want to go over some things that are unique to our machine, but mm -hmm. that can be adjusted on the fly. So even if you don't set this up correctly or optimally uh, from the word go, you can make these adjustments as you run. Mm -hmm. So let's, uh, for example, talk about our speed setting. We have 1,000 to 3,500 in 500 round increments. Mm -hmm. Some of the confusion happens where we have 3,500 listed here. And I'm going to tell you that I can't control centrifugal force. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not some deity. So yeah. when you try to run at 3,500, uh, you're probably going to have some bullets flip, uh, flip off the case. You're going to have a little bit of powder slosh. So finding your sweet spot mm -hmm. is going to be component dependent. Okay. Loading 230 grain 45 ACP here today, we have a lot of leeway. Mm -hmm. We're not loading a whole bunch of powder, and we're loading a very heavy for caliber, or sorry, you know, heavy, heaviest for caliber bullet. Mm -hmm. It's going to stay put on that case much better than a light for caliber bullet. Mm -hmm. And we are loading with less powder, so less chance of that powder sloshing out. Low center of gravity helps here, right? Exactly. Compared to that really tall, you know, 300 blackout subsonic with the oh, 220 man. grain bullet mm -hmm. flopping around on top. So we have a few <laughs> things we can do. We can play with our speed setting to find our sweet spot. Loading 45 mm -hmm. ACP, generally speaking, I'd say we can put it at 25, mm -hmm. see what happens, go from there. Mm -hmm. But the main thing we're gonna do is we're gonna adjust our index and potentially adjust our dwells. Hmm. Index, let me, let's run this out and we can talk about it a little more. Let's just hit run here, and I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna adjust the index on the fly. Bump it up to 2,000 rounds per hour. So if we watch how fast the index, how fast the shell plate is rotating, we can incrementally up our index, and it slows down the rotation of the shell plate hmm. on the fly to achieve what we want to achieve. So yeah. if we are getting powder slosh or we're getting uh, bullets toppling off the case, we can slow down our index as we go, find that sweet spot. In addition to that, we have our top and bottom dwell. Top dwell and bottom dwell are both for powder. Mm -hmm. So if we have a larger powder charge, we're mm -hmm. gonna have more top dwell and more bottom dwell than if we're loading a small powder charge. Mm -hmm. We want time for the cavity to refill in the powder measure at the top of the stroke, and we want time for that powder to fall down the funnel into the case at the bottom of the stroke. Yeah. The more powder we're using, the, more, the larger those numbers are gonna be. Just like when you're running a press manual. Exactly. That little weight, that little pause at mm -hmm. the bottom. No one loads 223 or 308, you know, lickety split right. like they load nine millimeter right. or 45. Yep, it's not instantaneous. No. So also on this screen, let me bump these back down to where we were at. We have our bottom slowdown feature. And this is really only used for trimming. So we don't ram a, a cutter into mm -hmm. our brass at full blast. 
So you get the advantage of speed during the rest of the cycle, but, but not you when get you need it. that optimal mm -hmm. trim. That's that's awesome. Okay, I'm gonna be trying that out soon. <laughs> and it looks something like that. Mm -hmm. Now, once again, this is only used for trimming. It's totally unnecessary for yeah. actively loading ammunition. Yep. Going back to our control tab, we already talked about our rounds per hour uh, on the fly adjustable, like I said. But I want to talk about digital clutch and torque sense. Mm -hmm. Much like the dwells, those are both two sides of the same coin. Okay. Digital clutch is that trip wire. Mm -hmm. It's that haptic feedback replacement on the downstroke. Mm -hmm. So if uh, we set that number as low as we can get away with, meaning under uh, proper conditions with the con uh, components we're loading, mm -hmm. if that number, we're set at a four right now, which is about where I expect it for 45 ACP. Now, if we were to run it at a three and it couldn't complete the stroke, that's fine. Mm -hmm. We'd leave it at four. But leaving that number as low as we can get away with ensures the machine stops at the soonest moment that an issue uh, presents itself. Mm -hmm. So once again, crush case or mispositioned bullet, we're going to potentially stop the machine before we waste components or cause any damage to dies or the machine. Mm -hmm. But torque sense is on the upstroke. We're not mm -hmm. doing a bunch of work on the upstroke, so really we want to leave that button green and, and enabled because all mm -hmm. it's doing is indexing the shell plate. If we have a stoppage that's preventing us from indexing the shell plate, I want the machine to stop yeah. immediately. I don't yeah. want to have to worry about you know, damaged components or mm -hmm. sorry, uh, damaged pieces of the machine because we tried to force through uh, mm -hmm. something that was jammed up. Right. But uh, so a digital clutch is on the fly adjustable in order to accommodate different calibers. Mm -hmm. Torque sense, leave it green, it's your safety measure. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also have jog up, jog down, which are for malfunction, malfunction clearance. Once mm -hmm. again, hand operated, right? If you have a sticky situation, you're not going to reset the whole <laughs> machine. You might just raise it up just a little bit, pull that uh, janky case out of there, yep. and then finish the stroke and keep rolling. Yeah. Same thing, jog up, jog down are used for. Mm -hmm. Doo -doo. And lastly, but not leastly, we have our sensor configuration screen, where we can once again turn sensors on on the fly as we operate and as we need them, or if we mm -hmm. need them. Mm -hmm. If I'm just processing brass, I'm not going to be loading powder, so I don't need powder check, mm -hmm. but I might want to turn on my decap sense and swage sense. Yeah, definitely. So on-the-fly adjustment is the core of what we, mm -hmm. uh, what we have with our machines. Getting to know them and uh, finding that sweet spot is where you're going to get the uh, most out of it. And using quality components is going to give you uh, a much smoother reloading session. Mm -hmm. And one part of that equation is doing good case processing, right? Case prep, or at minimum, you know, uh, culling the, you know, the uh, nine mil in your 40 cal cases and so yeah. on. And, <laughs> and uh, not running uh, dirty, crusty brass you picked up from a puddle outside. Yeah. So it's good to know that if you have good components and you've done proper case prep, you're not likely to have stoppages. But if you do, it's likely to be for a good reason. Mm -hmm. And that's a sign that you might want to check your process, mm -hmm. whether it be in your prep of cases or in how you have the machine set up and how you're using it. Yep. Well, thank you, John, for walking us through how to keep the auto drive running in perfect tip-top shape, maximum efficiency. This is super yes, helpful. You're very welcome, sir. Okay. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, and if you have guidelines. If you have tips and tricks that you use with your Mark 7 auto drive, drop a comment and let's start a discussion. That concludes this video and that means it's time to wrap it up. I hope you liked this video. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up. Also, make your voice heard. If you have something to say, please drop a comment. Make sure you're subscribed with notifications because you're not going to want to miss the awesome content that is coming up. And finally, flex your reloading pride. You could look great in one of these t-shirts. We've got multiple designs at the Ultimate Reloader store. I'll see you later because I'm off to go shooting.